Okay, so the Jetscape collaboration. <clears throat> this is, so what you wanna do out of all of these measurements is come up with some way, not just to do measurements. As my, my dear friend Sevi says, I don't actually care about jets. I want to learn about the core gluon plasma. So I want to use this as a tool. So how do you, because jets themselves, it's not useful to learn about them. We're using them because in principle, they're a probe of the core gluon plasma. So we want to take this and learn a property of the core gluon plasma from this. This is somewhat analogous when we did the flow section. When we measured flow, we learned about the viscosity of the medium. We want to learn something about the medium. <clears throat> so this is my one page summary of a seminal work by the JET collaboration. And what they did was that they took a brick of pork gluon plasma. They just it was a rectangular brick. And they did a bunch of calculations. So comparisons, they calculated this R, observable RAA in different models. So here you can see plots for four different models. And um, what they did is that they compared that, um, those predictions to the Phoenix Pi Zero measurements. And part of the reason for using, um, well, the reason for using Pi Zeros is because they're pretty easily, easy to measure at high precision, at high momentum. Um, and then if you have a bunch of different model calculations, so you vary the parameters of the model and you compare them to the data, you can make a plot like this one. This is chi squared per um, degree of freedom. So this chi squared is, again, a sum over all data points, the value you measured minus the value that you predicted. Um, that is not here. So chi squared is sum over all particles, y i minus your prediction, quantity squared divided by the uncertainty squared. So the better your chi squared is, the better your model is, because the closer the model is to the prediction, you plot that as a function of this observable called, or this variable called q hat. Q hat is a measure of how much energy a uh, parton loses in the medium. I think this one was for defined as how much energy a quark loses in the medium per, slightly, how much energy squared the quark loses per Fermi. Um, and <clears throat> then you can plot this line. An astute observer will say chi squared per degree of freedom should be centered around one, should not get lower than one. Why does this go below one? That is because the experiments did not report the correlations between their uncertainties, so the theorists had to assume that they were uncorrelated point to point. Um, <clears throat> so then you can look at this and you can use this to determine Q hat, because the value of Q hat is there, and the uncertainty is when chi squared per degree of freedom goes up by one. Um, and then you can calculate Q hat and do this um, at both the relativistic heavy ion collider and at the large hadron collider. <clears throat> so one can point to a number of limitations of this measurement. First of all, it was a brick. We don't have a brick of quark gluon plasma. What we have is an expanding cooling droplet. Um, each of these models you could poke holes in because they all have limitations and only should work in certain approximations. Um, and then 
the only data that they compared to was the Phoenix Pi Zero data. And we have taken literally, we have hundreds of papers just from the relativistic heavy ion collider. And we have hundreds from the Large Hadron Collider. You want to make a more systematic comparison between data and models. But hey, this was a, this was a fantastic start. OK, <clears throat> so what you can do is <clears throat> a Bayesian statistical analysis. And this gets really complicated. And so I'm really going to give a bird's eye view of this. So you have a Monte Carlo model. What is a Monte Carlo model? A Monte Carlo model means that you are trying to um, describe all of, you're trying to simulate, um, a Monte Carlo model is that you are doing something statistical. So you can actually use a Monte Carlo model to measure pi, where what you do is you have a circle and you, or you have a square and you draw a circle inside of it and you randomly put dots in it and you can use that and you can ask whether the dot is inside the circle or out and <clears throat> use the ratios to measure pi and it will work. It will get you the right value of pi. It is very computationally intensive. So um, I actually used to joke that, well, still do. So, I tell my brother that he found that he dated using a Monte Carlo model. High statistics, low specificity. So that's now there's some reasons you want to use a Monte Carlo model. There are some of the there are a lot of these processes in a heavy ion collision where the process itself is statistical. So um, if you're asking when do you you know what are what are the odds of finding an up quark with a certain momentum? You want a sample in your, inside your nucleus. You want a sample of the, the nucleus. And you want to include the fluctuations in the nucleus because these are <coughs> nuclei are not a static, not static objects. They're moving, the particles in them are moving around themselves. Um, and then it's really hard to get this. There is no real analytical. Um, approach to all of this. So you want to use a Monte Carlo model. The downside is that a typical hydrodynamical model in heavy ion collisions might take an, well, at least minutes and sometimes up to an hour to simulate one collision. And the data sets that we have are um, billions of events sometimes. And you don't want your, you want your model to be approximately as accurate as your data. <laughs> and moreover, if you want to sample different parameters, it, it already is incredibly in, computationally intensive to just get enough events to compare to the measurements. But you can't do this for thousands, let alone millions of different combinations of parameters. So what you do instead is that you do something called model emulation, which is that you sample your parameter space and you basically extrapolate between the two. Um, so using a process called um, a Markov chain. Um, and that way, you don't have to do a full simulation for the millions of combinations of parameters that you want to um, use. <clears throat> and what you'll do is that you then, for the, for the models, for the parameter spaces you actually do full simulations on, you will calculate the observables in that model. So here I've got as an example a single particle spectrum. The number of particles is a function of momentum and this observable v2. And so in your model you would calculate for this set of parameters this is what I get for the k-on spectrum and this is what I get for the pion spectrum and this is what I get for the v2 and um, you do your 
Monte Carlo model combined with model emulation to get a distribution of priors. So a distribution of what these observables would look like with different parameters. And then you do a Bayesian statistical analysis to constrain that, basically to throw out combinations of parameters that are not realistic and find the best combinations of parameters and figure out how well you have them constrained. And <clears throat> using that, you then, this is now a parameter in one direction and the same parameter, and the a parameter here and a parameter there. And the diagonal is where you have the same parameter. And what it shows is the distribution of um, <clears throat> the probability distribution for that parameter. So you can see that this one right here is reasonably well um, constrained, whereas here it's not as well constrained. And then these are the maps of the correlation between the two different parameters. Um, so in doing something like this, and I am only trying to give a bird's eye view, but in doing something like this, now you can actually systematically compare to a large number of measurements, not just RAA, but almost anything you can get your hands on. Um, and this is becoming a standard in, in science. Um, and it's been used for a while. I briefly mentioned that there are um, fragmentation functions that are constrained by data and the way that they, well, in parton distributions, which is the distribution of the number of partons inside nuclei or um, nucleons, those are constrained now using some, using an approach similar to this. So, the idea of Jetscape is basically to do this for heavy ion collisions. And now instead of this brick, we're taking a realistic medium using state-of-the-art hydrodynamical simulations, embedding a realistic jet in them, and then allowing the well, it, realistic partons and allowing those partons to travel through the medium with realistic energy loss so that the end product is a realistic Monte Carlo model. And there's a bunch of details. Jetscape really is not technically, uh, it's a framework for making theoretical predictions. So if you as a theorist want to plug in your different model, then you can do that um, <clears throat> because it's a package that lets you plug different pieces in in different spots. And then you want to apply your experimental technique, um, whatever you have to do for your measurement, so that you have a realistic theoretical calculation, a realistic theoretical prediction, which should be comparable to the data. Um, so the parts that are new in Jetscape compared to um, compared to the old days when George and I were graduate students uh, is that you know. This is the first time we've really had a fully realistic evolving medium with jets, um, which may sound basic, but it's just a really hard calculation to do. So this combination of a realistic medium and realistic jets has not really happened before. And then that means that this output product where you have a realistic Monte Carlo, meaning that you actually have a list of final state hadrons which should in principle be comparable to what you would measure in your detector. This, it, this has worked okay for hydrodynamical calculations where you're not sensitive to very high momentum hadrons, but it has never existed for jets before, um, especially in any way that you could systematically, especially where an experimentalist could run it. Um, so then, you know, what we're trying to do here is increase the number of different measurements. So here, schematically, I've just shown a selection of results which should, that sh are, in principle, sensitive to jets. And we want to incorporate as many of them as possible. And it's not necessarily that they would all then be used in this Bayesian statistical analysis, but <clears throat> 
at least they're then on the table so that you could try to constrain the properties of the QGP. Because what you'll see is that some measurements constrain some parameters better than others. And so what my students are doing is working on implementing the an analyses in this program called RIVET, which is um, robust independent validation of experiment and theory. And the way that it works is it's actually where you experiment, implement the experimental techniques so that you read a paper, you go in and you try to implement what it did um, so that all of these cuts that I talked about in the last section where there's different kinematic requirements for the constituents of jets and on and on, if those lead to any bias, if you do them in theory and in data, at least they should in principle have the same bias in theory and data so that your calculations should be comparable. And you end up with this messy problem that there's a lot of work to do and it's kind of thankless. And some of it is grunt work, going through the old collaboration web pages and digging out their um, papers and making sense of it and putting it in a format that we can use it in Rivet. So this is why I use undergrads, because undergraduates are available in near infinite supply and they are approximately free. So here you can see one of our early groups of undergrads hacking and I hacking away on doing analysis and my grad student, Austin. Um, and hopefully by getting undergrads plugged in, we take these couple hundred analyses that exist um, in heavy ion collisions and can actually get them incorporated so we can make comparisons. And let me pause now. That was a very dense, um, introduction to Jetscape. It doesn't matter if you got all of it, but I would hope that you get the big picture. Questions? I am not hearing questions. I think that was very dense. I am going to go ahead and stop the recording. I 